thanks to the persistent efforts of Representative Martinez Fisher and his staff in scrutinizing the bill and its progress and finding numerous points of order, HB 400 did eventually die an agonizing death. <laughs> the version that was reincarnated and passed in the summer special session, Senate Bill 8, was also detrimental but did not include those class size and salary schedules provisions. His efforts can be credited directly with saving those important statutes. We may be facing different problem bills this session, but we know we will continue to have a defender on our side. Please help me welcome our public official friend of education, Representative Trey Martinez Fisher. Wow, I've never seen that happen with a bunch of teachers. I was usually the child being told to go to time out. <laughs> I will tell you that to hear that introduction makes points of order sound so exciting, you know, so dramatic. And, and frankly, if you ever looked at our house rule book, you would, you know, you would know that I got a good public education because that book is hard to read. Uh, it's written by a bunch of lawyers. But, uh, you know, thank you, Nanette, and thank you, Jerry, and Lonnie and all my friends at TCTA, all the delegates of the TCTA, it's, it's an honor to stand up here and, and know that I actually did something that perhaps made a difference because I've been in Austin now, this is my seventh term, uh, and I always tell people that when they get up to Austin, I always tell the new members, you can do a lot of good, you can do a lot of bad, or you can do nothing at all. And so the question is, you know, which one are you going to be? And I say that because over the course of our decade, we have seen you know, people get behind microphones and get in public and talk about the reasons why we need to shrink government, the reasons why we need to cut back on spending, and the reasons why we need to hold the line. All those things sound fabulous. That's what I practice in my house. But people need to realize that shrinking government is not just food stamps and it's not just Medicaid. Shrinking government means that we're not going to put a dollar in education, and we saw $5.4 billion leave. We put 170,000 kids in classrooms and didn't give them a dime for a book, didn't give, didn't give school districts a dime for a facility. We have a water plan that we passed in 1997 that today costs $53 billion because we want to shrink government. We have a transportation plan and a policy that you will soon experience when you leave here uh, around 5 o'clock and get on MOPAC that we need $488 billion by 2030 to fix our transportation system. We won't put any money in it. We are 48th out of 48th lower states when it comes to the efficient transmission of our energy. This is Texas. This is oil and gas Texas. This is Eagle Ford Shell. This is Permian Basin. We are 48 when it comes to the reliability of our electricity grid. So just imagine if we put a billion dollars on the street and told municipal governments, regional governments, private sector, match us and let's build a new energy generation plant so that we can generate more energy so that we don't have rolling blackouts in, in the dead of winter or in, or in droughts in the summertime. And so suffice it to say, when we say we're going to shrink government, we're talking about a much bigger notion. You all are feeling it more than anybody else. And I will tell you that I didn't show up to Austin with the motive in my mind to kill House Bill 400. I showed up like everybody else ready to get to work. But sitting there on that House floor watching one bad policy pass after another and after another, you have to understand a little bit about me. I am from San Antonio, Texas. I am the son uh, of a... German Jew, uh, single parent. I am, the, I am the son of a woman who picked crops, uh, whose family came from Mexico. So I have this German Jew, Latino blood just all over me. 
And I wake up in the morning and that German Jew kicks in right away. And I get out of bed and I say, today, I think I'm gonna take over the world. <laughs> and I go outside and I get my newspaper, I get my coffee, I check my email, and then that Latino kicks in and I say to myself, mañana. And that's part of our problem in Texas, is, is mañana is the busiest day of the week. We never get there. We kick it down the road. And that's what we're doing in public education. This is a system that's growing. This is a system that needs investments. And it's really not that hard. It's making hard choices, smart investments, and asking the rest of the state to share the sacrifice. That has always been our way. That's what we're supposed to do. House Bill 400 didn't reflect that. Not only did it not only hurt children, it hurt educators, it hurt administrators, it hurt people who work in the school system to make sure that the lights are on and the food is cooked uh, and that the buildings are clean. Uh, this was bad policy. And so whenever I see bad politics getting in the way of good policy, I will get up and I will always get up. And I think those are the values that you all instill in your children on a day in and day out basis because I can tell you I can tell you that the one and only day that I got in real trouble at Holmes High School in San Antonio, Texas, was the day they canceled football practice. That was the one day I got in trouble. And I remember as a first term member in the Texas House, I had a veteran chief of staff who had worked for giants like Barry Telford and Mark Stiles, and these people were walking giants in the Texas legislature. So she was telling me how it was gonna be as a rookie freshman, and she said, and we will not be responding to any correspondence from prison or prisoners. And I said, well, why? She said, because if you write one letter to an inmate, you'll get 10 more, and you'll become the pen pal of the prison. And I said, well, what happens in the instance where there's a prisoner who's beat up by a you know, guard or there's something really bad going on, and how do we, you know, how can we have a policy like that? And so we debated and we compromised and we said, we won't respond to the inmate, but we'll respond to the family. We'll send a direct correspondence to the family. And lo and behold, I get this letter. And it started off with, dear Tracy. Anybody who calls me Tracy has known me from 1998, 1988 and before. Uh, because my name is Trey and I have a cousin named Trey. He would do something wrong, I'd get spanked. So right away, <laughs> I changed my name to Tracy. And he said, it seems like yesterday we were on that football field. You know, you obviously made good choices. I didn't make the same choices you made. And he goes on to say a lot of things, but ultimately he says, I have a parole hearing coming up. And I'd like to know if you could put a good word in for me. And if that doesn't paint the picture of the difference a teacher makes in a student's life, whether you're in a school district that's affluent and have every piece of opportunity that you can imagine, or you're in one of those challenging school districts that's always trying to scratch two nickels together uh, to make things work. There's always the power and influence of that teacher. So that Judy Howe, that freshman government teacher who said if you weren't so obnoxious and such a tyrant out there on the playground, perhaps you could be a class president. You know, and it was the same value that that coach Molesky saw in me who said, if you directed those energies in a positive way, perhaps you could be the captain of this football team. And there were those values and those things I learned at Holmes High School. I think shaped and influenced the way I make decisions today. It's made me the person that I am today. And more than that, it has put on my shoulders a tremendous sense of responsibility that now I have to turn around and do that for somebody else. And so when I look at these policies, I'm thinking about my four-year-old daughter who is yet to reach the school system, and I'm thinking about my two-and-a-half-year-old daughter who is yet to reach the public school system. And I think that if we all start thinking like that, if we start thinking about not shrinking government but creating opportunity, being smart about our investments, thinking long-term, we will have a lot to be proud of. And so until, unless and until that time, I will sit at my desk with my rule book, with my ability to be persuasive, uh, and try to see if we can 
restore $5.4 billion in cuts, dip into the rainy day fund because A, that's what it's for, and B, it's your money. <laughs> and I know this, this isn't a partisan issue. This is an issue that I take to Democrats, I take to Republicans, I take to independents. LBJ said education is not a problem, it's an opportunity. George Herbert Walker Bush said, think about every problem, every challenge we face, the solution to each starts with education. We know this isn't partisan. It takes a partnership. I will do my part, you have been doing your part. We have lots of people to talk to. We have a new education committee. We're perhaps gonna have a brand new chairman for the first time, and we have our work cut out for us. And so it starts now. And I'm willing to do whatever I need to do to make sure that we're bringing sound policies back to Austin. Uh, my preference is to roll up my sleeves and be involved in the policy making, but always have a plan B. I'll have my rule book and I'll know how to call a point of order. And we'll slow this thing down until we get it right. So thank you very, very much. It means a lot. <laughs>